It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I uh, appreciate that. My uh, first question is actually to the Premier. Uh, and the question is this, is the um, former Premier Bill Davis an NDP Toronto City Councillor? Premier. Well, through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to the Leader of the Opposition, I want to remind the Leader of the Opposition why we're doing this. We're doing this because there's absolute gridlock. Yeah. Here, here. The hardworking people in the back of the factories, the hard people, hardworking people in the offices, the hardworking construction folks, they take three hours out of their day to go from their home to work. That's three hours a day. That's costing the economy, by the way, billions and billions of dollars. We're doing this because we have a dysfunctional government. We need to build transit because Toronto is one of the major engines, along with the 905, keeping this province moving forward. We are in a crisis Spons. when it comes to housing, an absolute crisis. People can't even find places to live. Infrastructure is crumbling underneath our feet. We Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, yesterday the Premier insisted that only NDP Toronto City Councillors objected to his scheme to override the Charter of Rights. Yet, even as he was saying those words, former Premier Bill Davis was denouncing this Premier's plan. To quote the former PC Premier, I say this. Quote, that Section 33 might now be used regularly to assert the dominance of an elected order. politician over the rule of law or the legitimate jurisdiction of our courts of law was never anticipated or agreed to, to and to Premier Davis was at the table when the Charter was drafted. He was the leader of the Premier's party. Can the Premier explain why he's right and the former PC Premier is not? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, I can start naming all the constitutional experts across this country that totally disagree. Will come to order. I, could, I could throw up former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. I can start naming them all, but I'm not going to. What I'm going to do, my, my friends, we're going to focus on turning this province around. And I just, wa I just wondered what the Leader of the Opposition and all her members were doing yeah. when the Liberal government was losing 300,000 jobs, exactly. when they were raising hydro rates to be the highest in North America, when, when they were raising taxes Never to an unprecedented to level. I'll tell you what the NDP were doing. They were propping them up. They were supporting them. I never saw them protest. They're protesting to protect their downtown NDP buddies. That's why they're protesting. Final supplementary. Well, Premier Davis isn't the only Conservative coming out against this Premier's plan to override the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney says he's not a fan of the notwithstanding clause, and he never has been. Former PC Cabinet Minister Brad Clark says he's never supported the notwithstanding clause or its invocation. Former Federal Justice Minister and Federal PC Leader Peter McKay joined the chorus and said, I quote, it was never intended for this purpose. The only Conservatives defending the Premier's decision are the ones who rely on him for their jobs. That's right. How can the Premier be so certain that he is right when so many thoughtful Conservatives are telling him he is utterly and totally wrong? Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you for such kind words that you agree with some great Conservative leaders. My, my, my friends, <laughs> we're going to make sure we're going to make sure we get this city going. And again, I find it—I just find it amazing how they brought all their buddies down yesterday, and they're all jumping around up and down. Where were these people 
when people's hydro were getting cut off. Thousands of families yep. around this province yep. were getting their hydro the cut off. I didn't hear the Leader of the Opposition say a peep. No. When 300,000 people were losing their jobs, I never heard the Leader of the Opposition say a peep. Well, they voted with them. When the Leader of the Opposition was threatening to close down the Pickering nuclear facility, 4,500 jobs. They would have been out of a job right now if it was up to the NDP. Gone. We would be paying $2 a litre for gas yep. if it was up to the NDP. Yep. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also uh, to the Premier, but I will say what uh, wasn't the case during the election campaign remains not the case today, Speaker. Uh, notwithstanding that, the Premier's bragged uh, very clearly that he won't be shy about overriding the Charter again if there are issues where he just isn't getting his way. So can the Premier tell us if there's any circumstance at all in which he wouldn't override the Charter? Premier. For the people. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Leader of the Opposition, this is in the Constitution, Section 92, Subsection 8. If it wasn't there to be used, it would not be there. My friends, we're here to stand up for the people. We're here to make sure that we have a dysfunctional government in the City of Toronto to turn it around. And I can tell you, I can tell you whoever the mayor is going to be, they're going to be as happy as punch because they're going to be able to actually get things done rather than talk about shark fin soup for, for two or three days that they do down there. Rather than talk about a bunch of nonsense, we're going to be able to build subways. We're going to be able to get this city moving and we're going to fix the housing crisis in this city. Please. Start the clock. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The uh, Premier was crystal clear. He's not going to be shy about overriding our charter rights. The town of Ajax has passed a resolution condemning the Premier's plan to override the charter because they fear they could be next. And while the member for Nepean insists that Ottawa's council is safe, the Premier went on the radio musing that he might be willing to throw that city's election into chaos, too. Now that the Premier shown he's ready to uh, do this to Ontarians in the city of Toronto, why should anyone believe that he won't do it again and again and yeah, again yeah. and again? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Again, where was the leader of the NDP when the Liberals were raising taxes, hydro rates, making it the most indebted region in, in the world? I didn't see all the lawsuits coming. I did not see any lawsuits coming from their special interest groups, politically act, act, activists that are getting paid by these special interest groups to come down here and disrupt Queen's Park. We live in a democracy. This is going to be the will of the people. We We're re-elected with 2.3 million people to move forward and make change in, changes in this province. Mr. Speaker, we're going to get this province going. We're going to make sure that we lower gas prices, we lower taxes, we put money back into the people's pocket instead of taking money. You know one thing. And that's to raise taxes, to raise gas, gas prices. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. <laughs> Members will take their seats. Thank you. Order. The Premier will come to order. The Premier will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. 
Member for Scarborough Southwest, come to order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. I suspect, Speaker, that um, the Premier missed a heck of a lot of what went on in Ontario because he was probably in Chicago during that time. That's right. Uh, listen, Ontarians need a government that will tackle wait times in hospitals, Speaker. That's what Ontarians need a government that will tackle wait times in hospitals. The state of our classrooms and the the communities that have been hit so hard by job loss under this government's short watch. Instead, we have a premier that's taking a chainsaw to the Charter of Rights to implement a scheme that he didn't even campaign on. And he has made it clear that nobody's rights, nobody's rights in this province are safe. Why won't the premier step back, Speaker, admit that this is wrong, scrap this bill, and respect the people of Ontario and Canada? The ruling that's wrong. Through you, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to find out where the NDP was for the last 15 years. They yep. were propping up the Liberals. 97 percent. 97 percent of the time, yep. they were in favour of raising hydro rates. Yep. Tax. Raising taxes, Official opposition come to order. losing 300,000 jobs. Where were you, Leader of the Opposition? I'll tell you where the Leader of the Opposition was. They were side by side with the Liberal government destroying this province. They were side by side this government in creating the green energy scam, the carbon tax, the Green Energy Act. That's what you're focused on. You aren't focused on creating jobs because Ever since we've been down here, Leader of the Opposition, through you, Mr. Spons. Speaker, not one idea have you ever come up with reducing taxes, creating jobs. You're too busy. Peter will take his seat. Stop the clock. Order. Member for Niagara Falls, come to order. Member for Hamilton East, Ancaster Dundas, come to order. <laughs> Government side, come to order. Start the clock. Next question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, as the candidate for the PC leadership who received the highest number of votes from uh, PC members, how comfortable is she with the plan to override the charter rights that have been denied by a party, or rather, that has been denied, denounced by party luminaries like Bill Davis, Peter McKay, and Brian Mulroney? Clock sticking. Order. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what my great Deputy Premier and Minister of Health is doing. Working around the clock, exactly. fixing the broken health care system that you helped the Liberals crop up. Help reducing the debt. Help creating jobs. Exactly. That's what we need in Ontario. We need to create good paying jobs. We need to reduce the taxes, which we're doing to a point of 20 percent for anyone making up towards $80,000, we're actually putting money back into Locking those folks' in. pockets. And the people on minimum wage, they're going to pay a 0% tax. They'll have a tax credit of $800 rather than being taxed, taxed to death. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. 
to the uh, back to the deputy premier speaker during the last election campaign the conservative brain trust put the deputy premier front and center she was supposed to be a key member of the team speaking speaking for the sort of traditional traditional progressive Order conservative values side. exemplified by bill issue. davis and brian mulroney now they're speaking out but she's silent. A former PC Premier, a former PC Prime Minister, a former PC, uh, PC leader, uh, leaders, both federal and provincial speaker, former PC Cabinet Ministers, federal and provincial speaker. All of these folks are speaking up against a plan that tramples on the Charter. Why does the Deputy Premier think they're wrong and her Premier's right? <laughs> Premier. You're laughing at the speaker now? This is, this is unbelievable. Through you, Mr. Speaker, may, maybe the Leader of the Opposition should start focusing on saving jobs and tweeting nasty tweets last night, most insulting tweet I've ever seen, finally had enough common sense to take it down. Yeah. But that's their method. Their method is attack, 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 rather than create jobs, lower taxes, putting money back into people's pocket instead of lining their own pockets, taking care of all their downtown NDP councillors, taking care of their political activists. That's what they're concerned about. We're concerned about lowering taxes, lowering gas prices, lowering hydro rates by 12 per cent, putting 10 cents per litre back into the people's pocket, and driving the economy. As as I've always said, a new day is dawn in Ontario. Stop the call. Members will take your seat. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the spirit of uh, how things are going today, I have a very tough and difficult question for the Minister of Agriculture, oh, yeah. Food and Rural Affairs. <laughs> Actually, I wrote it. Thank you very much. Earlier today, <laughs> earlier today, we saw unanimous consent in order for the House to not sit Monday, September 17th, and Tuesday, September 18th, to allow the members of legislature to attend the international plowing match. Can the minister tell us why attending the 2018 international plowing match is so important to the government of Ontario? Mr. Speaker, thank the uh, member for the, uh, for the question. The 2018 international plowing match is the 101st international plowing wow. match for the province. This year it will be held in Pancourt, Ontario, and is one of the largest outdoor events of its kind in North America. This government is committed to supporting rural Ontario. Absolutely. We recognize the tremendous opportunity for economic development and growth in rural Ontario. Our government was elected by the people, for the people, and this includes the people in rural and remote parts of the province. Yeah. Ensuring that Ontario is open for business includes ensuring that rural Ontario is open for business. Cutting hydro rates, reducing red tape and regulatory burdens, and scrapping the cap-and-trade carbon tax yes, yeah, here, will here. all help rural Ontario prosper. I look forward to hearing from the people at the 2018 International Plowing Lots. Match on how we can continue to make changes that work for them. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for that answer. I look forward to attending the 2018 International Plowing Match alongside many of my colleagues in the legislature, and hopefully I get the opportunity to relive my childhood and can climb back up on the cockshut 20. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. What kinds of issues can we expect to hear at the International Plowing Match? Well, thank you, thank you again, Mr. Minister. And thank the member for the question. As mentioned previously, Ontario is open for business, and this includes rural Ontario. The people of Ontario, including our farmers and those in our rural communities, suffered far too long under the previous government where life was unaffordable and families often had to make tough decisions. 
This government is committed to working with the people to bring the kinds of change that works best for them to make life affordable again. Here, here. Our government is scrapping the cap and trade, carbon, ta cap and trade carbon tax, reducing hydro rates and removing red tape and regulatory burdens that make it harder for business to be competitive. I believe our farmers produce the best quality of food in the world, here, here. and I'm committed to helping them continue to do so. I've had the opportunity to speak with many of our stakeholders Response. and organizations on these issues and look forward to speaking with them further at the 2018 uh, International Plowing Match this year. And thank you all, and we hope everyone in the legislature comes there to celebrate with our farming community. Thank you. Next question. The member for University Rosedale. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Every time the Premier mentioned transit yesterday, he said something false. Toronto's 45-seat council has approved— I have to ask the member to withdraw. Withdrawn. The council has approved many transit projects. They've opened up a new subway extension. The Eglinton Cross Town is also on its way. Bill 5 is not about transit or efficiency. In fact, yesterday, the Premier repeatedly confirmed that the real purpose of Bill 5 is to target progressive Toronto councillors, mentioning several of them by name. Why does the minister think it's justifiable to ignore real transit priorities and take away fundamental human rights just so this Premier Question. can disrupt local democracy to settle personal scores? Minister of Transportation. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, thanks to my colleague and uh, through you, Speaker. Uh, thank you uh, to the member for that uh, question. What I, what I can't understand, Speaker, is why that member continues to stand up for more politicians, continues to stand up for the deadlock and dysfunction that has plagued Toronto Council for years. What we're trying to do, Speaker, is very, very clear. We want to make sure that on October 22nd, that new council a streamlined council of 25 that matches the federal and provincial constituencies is ready to work on making those important decisions, on being able to build transit and fix infrastructure and build affordable housing. I would hope that the member opposite agrees with those principles. Supplementary. I would love to debate transit in this House, but transit is not this Premier's priority. This Premier has called an emergency session because his real priority is to settle personal scores with Toronto. Yeah. Even if this means disrupting an election. Once again, I'm going to ask the members to observe the rule that we do not impute motive. I'm going to ask the member to put her question. Go on. Even if this means casually invoking the notwithstanding clause for the first time in Ontario's history. Why isn't this minister helping riders with a plan to fund municipal transit operations instead of helping the Premier take away fundamental human rights? Minister. Again, uh, Speaker, to the member, through you to the member opposite. The Premier and our government, we believe in better local government. We believe in respecting taxpayers' dollars. I reject those comments from that member opposite. This, I'll put this Premier's record and his words on building transit, building affordable housing and fixing infrastructure in this city. Anyone, anyone speaker who listens to the Premier knows that he loves his city, knows that he wants to be able to work with the Council on those very important priorities. I reject those, that member's uh, inflammatory words and unparliamentary words. We're standing up for better local government. And Bill 31 stands up for efficient local government. Start the clock. The next question the member for York Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, Section 33 of the Constitution respects a centuries-old principle, a principle common to all British parliamentary systems, including our own. The principle is parliamentary supremacy. 
That's why when finalizing the Charter, our friends from the Prairies insisted on the inclusion of Section 33 in the event that the court exceeds its jurisdiction. With respect to the court, on Monday, the court exceeded its jurisdiction. Speaker, the law is clear. Applications are designed for findings of fact and especially not of this magnitude. With respect to the learned judge, finding that Toronto City Councilor cannot effectively represent 110 people is just not an error of law. It's an error of, it's an error of law and an error of fact in that the court exceeded its jurisdiction. To do so and strike down our government's priority is precisely what the drafters of Section 33 had in mind. Conversely, conversely, our government's intent— our, Excuse me. Our government's— That's the opposition to come to order. Yeah. You exceeded your time. Response. Minister Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. To you, to the to York Center, uh, thank you for the question, and thank you for standing up for the principles of democracy. Uh, let me be clear, Speaker. Let me be clear, Speaker. There is only one reason why we introduced this legislation, and that's to fix the dysfunction and political gridlock that has paralyzed City Hall. It would be irresponsible to just sit back and watch as council spins its wheels for four more years. We can't afford, Speaker, to let another term go by without those improvements in transit and in infrastructure and in affordable housing. We made a promise, Speaker. We made a promise to provide better local government for all Ontarians, including Torontonians. And that's a promise, Speaker, we're going to keep. Thank you, Minister. Back to, back to the Minister of uh, Housing and Municipal Affairs. Speaker, our government's intended use of the clause is entirely lawful since such power is expressly afforded to the government in the Charter. To suggest that our action is unlawful is an affront to the Constitution since the Constitution expressly permits it. Our government, our, government campaign, our government campaign on a clear message, reducing the size of government and making government work better for the people. Toronto is the economic engine of this province and this country. For the people of York Centre in North Toronto, building infrastructure and building subway, subway, subway is a priority. And they expect this government to use every lawful measure available to it to make use on these priorities, a measure that is expressly provided for in the Charter. Could the minister kindly explain why is it so important to respo respond to week this week's court ruling by passing Bill 31? Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. And uh, again, thank you for the supplementary. The, the member is right. Uh, the NDP is the only voice in Ontario that's calling for more politicians. The Better Go Local Government Act uh, aligned municipal ward boundaries with the federal and provincial ridings. It gave Toronto 25 MPs, 25 MPPs, and 25 city councillors. The system works well in Ottawa. It works well here, I, uh, with all due respect, at Queen's Park. A streamlined council is more efficient. But it's also less expensive, reducing the size of uh, Toronto Council from 47 councillors to 25 members saves at least $25 million over the next four years. Our priorities, speaker, our, our priorities are simple. Here's what we want to give uh, to Ontarians. Affordable, accountable, effective and efficient government. That's what we're going to provide. Thank you. Next question, member for Humber River, Black Creek. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. We all have been called back to the legislature for an emergency sitting, but instead of actually debating issues that the people of Ontario expect us to tackle, this government is taking the unprecedented step of invoking the notwithstanding clause to trample on our charter rights. Does the minister believe? Trampling on the charter rights of, of Torontonians is a more urgent issue than lowering auto insurance rates so that Ontarians aren't paying $4 billion more in premiums than drivers in the rest of the country. Minister of Finance. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank Municipal you, Speaker. And, uh, 
again, uh, through you, Speaker, to the member. Uh, our government's position is that this legislation is a valid exercise in the province's jurisdiction over uh, provincial, our provincial jurisdiction over municipalities. We've said very clearly uh, throughout the entire campaign that we want to reduce the size and cost of government. Uh, we want to have an efficient, accountable, effective government. And on October 22nd, and listen, time is of the essence. October 22nd is fast approaching. We want to have that a fast and efficient and streamlined council ready for that election. The uh, Bill 31, that's exactly what we're trying to accomplish, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Residents in my riding of Humber River, Black Creek pay sky high auto insurance rates because the government continues to allow insurers to charge drivers higher premiums based on what neighborhood they live in. When I go door to door and talk to my constituents about unfair auto insurance premiums, that is at the top of their list of concerns they expect this government to deal with. Not unilaterally, unilaterally cutting Toronto City Council. Minister, why is violating Torontonians' charter rights a higher priority than ending unfair neighbourhood discrimination in the setting of auto insurance premiums. Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you again, Speaker, and again through, through the member. I, I can't understand how this member could stand in his place and allow four more years of deadlock and dysfunction at Toronto City Council. I can't understand that. We, we made it very, very clear, Speaker. I, I'm trying to get this uh, in the calmest possible way for the member to understand that, that a 25-member council that has the same boundaries as the federal MPs, the federal MP, uh, provincial MPPs, it, it's going to provide that streamlined council so they can exactly. make those important decisions. The Premier and I are on the same page. Our government's on the same page. We want to give them the tools to do that. And October 22nd is fast approaching. Why doesn't the member agree that it's well within our rights as a provincial jurisdiction to deal Response. with this bill, to have it passed for the municipalities, and to actually provide some certainty for Toronto City Council? Next question, member for Ottawa, Vanier. Monsieur, Mr. Speaker, to the Attorney General. Government has a duty to act responsibly. As the Attorney General considered that she could lose her appeal of Justice Balobaba, not only on freedom of expression grounds, but also on the other violations that were alleged that cannot be obliterated by the notwithstanding clause, with the prospect of an unconstitutional City Council sitting in Toronto. As she considered that Bill 31 used the notwithstanding clause in an ill-advised way, in a retroactive way, which she cannot do, as she considered that Bill 31 raises other legal uncertainties because it uses the notwithstanding clause in the context of a democratic rights, as she considered all the legal challenges that are about to be Question. unleashed against the Bill 31, does she believe that costly legal battles and legal uncertainty is good for Ontario? Thank you. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for her question. We are using the Charter, as I said, to uphold the Constitution. And our... the, 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 the people of Ontario are well within their rights to bring legal challenges to the government, and it is my ministry's job to defend the government in those instances. I cannot speculate on what, what future litigation will come, but I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that we believe that the Legislature's decision to reduce the size of Toronto River City Waterloo Council to and bring voter parity to Toronto is constitutional and does not violate the Charter. That is why our government has appealed the ruling and is seeking a stay of the Superior Court decision. And we will await Response. the result of the appeal. Thank you. Stop the call. Members will please take your seat. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you. 
Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, and any government intervenes in an election, no matter what election, it rightfully raises significant concerns. Elsewhere in the world, this leads to questions of whether the government is changing the rules to pick a winner, to eliminate our adver adversaries, or to distort voter preferences. That's why people are concerned, and that's why legal challenges are to be expected. And we know that elected officials that are elected under a cloud of illegitimacy, under a cloud that is raised by the fact that violations of rights have been found, and the notwithstanding clause confirms that indeed violations of rights have been found. They will be elected under a cloud of legal doubt, marred by controversies. Does she Question. believe that, that this is a service to Toronto to elect people that will be efficient but will continue to operate in an illegitimate fashion? Mr. Speaker, we are using the legal tools at our disposal to provide the certainty that the people of the City of Toronto need to respect to their election. Section 33 of the Charter confirms the paramountcy of the of legislatures to decide matters within their jurisdiction, and it is a tool that recognizes the long-standing principle that Canada is a parliamentary democracy. Section 33 the purpose of Section 33 is to provide a mechanism so that where there is a disagreement between a judge and a legislature surrounding the constitutionality of a law, that the people get the final say. And as with all exercises of parliamentary power, the ramifications of our decision will occur at the ballot box, and that is a principle of parliamentary democracy. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people made it very clear during the election that we are committed to improving health care systems by increasing investments in critical services across our province, including in rural and remote regions. I know that the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund is a great tool that our government is using to affect real change in northern regions. Can the minister please provide the members with an update on a new project that is going to improve the lives of northern Ontarians? I thank the member from Ottawa West Nepean uh, for his important question. I thank the premier uh, for his leadership and the minister of health. Uh, as the minister responsible for Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, but perhaps more importantly as a, a former nurse who's worked extensively in Northern Ontario, I have a deep appreciation for the needs, the issues, but more importantly, the opportunities that we have to improve access to quality health care services. And that's why the Northern Ontario uh, Heritage Fund, uh, Mr. Speaker, has responded. And I'm pleased to announce that we'll be providing more than $1.5 million in resources Fantastic. for the Nipissing and Perry Sound District. To build a new palliative care facility. This goes to one of our core commitments to uh, uh, improve health care services across Ontario, but importantly for Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, at an important Bonds. critical time in the lives of people, uh, patients, and their families. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his leadership on this important file. Mr. Speaker, we know that end-of-life care and decisions are an extremely difficult time for individuals and their families. I am proud that the government is taking a leadership role investing in end-of-life and hospice care through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. Can the minister explain the impacts of this investment on the lives of local residents in the Nipsing area and their families? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the minister and to the member from uh, Ottawa West Nepean. This investment of $1.5 million to help build this new palliative care facility in Nipissing will have a huge impact to the people uh, in the area. Once built, the Nipissing Serenity Hospice will be a home away from home, helping those who need it most, those who are facing the most difficult path of end-of-life care. It will be a caring and supportive environment where friends and families can receive the dignity, compassion, and quality of care they deserve in their final days. Through this investment, our government reaffirms its commitment to building a health care system that works for patients and their families. Our government has committed to improving all the lives of the people in every corner of our great province. Speaker, that is a promise made by Premier Ford and a promise kept. Yeah. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock again. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. Yesterday, this government introduced a bill that invokes the notwithstanding clause. We are spending time and resources on a bill that violates our fundamental charter rights, including the rights of Ontarians to fundamental freedoms and legal rights, including our right to life, liberty and security of the person, our right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure, our right not to be arbitrarily detained or imprisoned. He is suspending our rights just so as the Premier freely admits he can settle his score with Mike Layton and Joe Cressy. Speaker, does the minister so, once again, once again, I'm going to remind all members and ask them not to impute motive in their question. Please put your question. Withdrawn, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, does the minister does the minister believe that violating the charter rights of Torontonians is a more pressing issue than working on gun violence and poverty in this city? Minister of Community Safety. I refer the matter to uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I want to uh, thank my colleague, Speaker. I also want to, uh, to thank you for your work in, uh, in dealing with the tone and uh, some of the unparliamentary language that I'm hearing from the, uh, from the opposition. Uh, our government has introduced the uh, Efficient Local Government Act and also to invoke Section 33 of the Charter to ensure that uh, the City of Toronto's wards and the number of councillors uh, can be aligned to 25 prior to the October 22nd election. It's very important for us to put that, uh, that, that forward as a, as a bill at the earliest possible convenience. As, as you know, the Premier uh, made a commitment to recall this legislature because time is of the essence. The October 22nd election is fast approaching, and we need to have this bill on the order paper in order to provide That's that right. streamlined council to make those very important decisions. And again, uh, you know, the, the member Response. can have inflammatory rhetoric and, and take pot shots at uh, my premier and our government, but but let's let's get to the to the reason that we are here. We're here to deal with efficient local government. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I don't blame the Minister of Community Safety and, Community and uh, Correctional Services for not standing up to defend his government. I hope he has the guts not to stand up to vote, to vote to suspend our rights when this bill comes to a vote. We should be working in this House on issues like affordable housing and childcare, on public transit in the city. I, we should be working on the fact that Toronto is the po child poverty capital of Canada. And we need to change that. That's what we should be working on. We should not be working on a bill. There is no urgency to pass this Side bill come to, order. to suspend the rights of the people of this city and of this province. Minister, will you be supporting this bill? Minister of Affairs and Health. Well, speaker, I introduced the bill yesterday, so I, I am going to be supporting the bill. Well, speaker, again, again, through you to the members. So, so, you know, I just, I just want to put this into perspective. You know, Toronto City Council is meeting right now. So, with, with all due respect to his first question, rather than. 
having a meeting at Toronto City Hall to match the $25 million that we put into guns and gangs, or rather to have a discussion about building affordable housing or building transit. Again, we're having the same debate at City Hall today where we're going around and around and around arguing about the number of politicians. There are important decisions that Toronto City Council could be making to work with our government on those important issues. Instead, they're having that circular debate over and over again, Speaker. It's unproductive. We're talking about efficient local government, government that's accountable to the people, that makes those important decisions that help the residents. Stop the call. Members will take their seats. Start the call. Next question, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports. Speaker, as you and many of us in this chamber know, the Toronto International Film Festival is one of the largest public film festivals in the world. It is imperative to both film lovers, the film industry, and Ontario's economy. TIFF welcomes stars and film industry personnel from around the world. It, it also showcases Ontario to the global film and television as a great place to invest in. Can the minister inform the House how TIFF contributes to the cultural fabric of Toronto and Ontario? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the uh, question from the, my colleague from Mississauga East Cooksville, because TIF is important and it is an economic driver. Each September, the world comes to Toronto for a celebration of the best in Canadian and international film. TIF has become one of the most prestigious and respected international film festivals. Ten days when the world comes to our city to be immersed in film, creativity, and, cre and culture. TIF strengthens Ontario's economy, creates jobs, and reinforces that Ontario is a leader in film production. Congratulations to the filmmakers, the actors, the writers who have enjoyed success at TIFF this year. I also want to acknowledge the important role that event sponsors, volunteers, and TIFF staff under the leadership of Pierce Handling are to TIFF's success. There is no doubt that TIFF Spons. is a cultural, tourist, and economic success. I'd like to thank the minister very much for that answer, Mr. Speaker. Being in Toronto during TIFF has certainly opened my eyes to precisely how important this festival is to the city, both as an economic driver and cultural staple. However, I'm sure there are many asking themselves how the film industry impacts their lo local economy. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister let us know what economic impacts that the film and television industry has across the province of Ontario? Minister. The, the economic impact from the domestic and film, TV and television markets on Ontario's economy has been unbelievably positive. Sudbury alone has seen over 90 film and TV series shot there since 2012, wow. with more investment coming in. Ottawa has seen movies like Batman and Robin, Penthouse North, Sacrifice, and The Black Coat's Daughter, which premiered at TIFF in 2015. In one year, film and television production contributed $3 billion to Ontario's economy and supported 54,000 jobs. This number increase as investment continues to grow and our government makes Ontario's economy more competitive. Just this week, I toured the Cinespace Kipling Studio campus in Etobicoke, Response. the largest of its kind in Canada and the capacity to host six large TV projects at one time. They are expanding, Speaker. Under Premier Ford leadership, Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member from Meshkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is to the my question is for the pre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all have been called back to the legislators for this emergency emergency sitting, but instead of actually debating issues that the, that the people of Ontario expect us to de, to tackle, this government is taking the unprecedented step of invoking the notwithstanding clause to tramp on the rights 
of the people of Toronto. This government Minister has a Toronto obsession. Services they are ignoring the issues facing northern and rural Ontario. Does the Premier believe tramping on the Charter of Rights of Torontonians is more urgent issue than making sure the children of Keshechewan has a safe school to attend? Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what the Premier is concerned about. The Premier is concerned about creating good paying jobs, getting the city moving, getting transit moving, stopping the guns and games. I'll tell you, my friends, I find it ironic the City of Toronto is meeting today because I personally asked the Mayor to call a special meeting for the guns and gangs. We handed $25 million over to the police. The mayor refused to call the meeting. But when it comes down to saving all the little politicians down at the city of Toronto, they called a meeting instantly. They're getting their priorities mixed up. We need to get the city moving again, and we will get the city moving again. Order. Member for King Vaughan, come to order. Back to the Premier. The community of Keshechwan ordered their school closed because of the repair backlog. There is a chronic water damage. The walls grow hot, but the fire alarms don't work. Children are getting lung infection and pneumonia from the mold. I toured the community speaker. I saw it with my own eyes. What tops the list of concern of my constituent is make sure their children doesn't lose an entire school year because of their school is falling apart. Not unilaterally cutting Toronto City Council. Premier, why is violating Toronto charter rights a higher priority than getting the kids of Keshechewan into a safe school they can learn in? For you, Mr. Speaker, and to my colleague, maybe if the Liberal government didn't waste billions and billions of dollars, the school wouldn't be in the shape they're in right now. That's what our that is what our motive is. Our motive is to turn this province around, save the taxpayers money, and to school. Build new hospitals, make sure we get the economy going to stimulate the economy by putting money back into the people's pockets. Not unlike the NDP that want to raise taxes, waste billions of dollars, increase the carbon tax, $2 a litre gasoline, highest fiber rates in North America. All you want to do is tax the death out of the taxpayers of this great province. Respond. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Perry Sound Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community, Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, our government was elected with a mandate to improve public safety across our province and to provide the brave men and women of our police services with the tools and resources they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. Policing infrastructure has been ignored the last 15 years. As a result, a growing number of OPP detachments across Ontario, like the one in Perry Sound, have exceeded their useful life cycle and require replacement due to health and safety concerns. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the members of this legislature on how his ministry is addressing the aging community safety infrastructure in this province? Thank you. Response, Minister of Thank you, Mr. Speaker, services. and uh, I'd like to thank the member from Perry South Muskoka for the question. As you know, 
during the election campaign, we made a promise to all Ontarians that we would improve public safety in this great province and provide Ontario police forces with the tools and resources they require to do their jobs. In effect, I'm very proud to say that that's exactly what we're doing. You made an announcement previously about the $25 million that was going to be advanced to the City of Toronto. And I'm proud to report to the members of the Legislature that our government is keeping its promise and showing its leadership. We are going to invest $182 million in replacing aging OPP detachments so that communities can continue to receive modern, cost-efficient and high-quality high services throughout the province of Ontario and deliver essential public safety. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Minister, for the response. Mr. Speaker, as a member of this government, I'm proud that we're keeping our promise of making community safety a true priority all across this province. Many of the new OPP detachments will be in northern Ontario, an area that was largely ignored by the last government. Mr. Speaker, will the minister ex please explain how these new OPP detachments will improve public safety across northern Ontario? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to defer that question to the Minister of Energy, Northern Affairs, Mines and Indigenous People. Minister of Energy, Northern thank Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, for his advocacy uh, there in Perry Sound. I want to thank the Premier Great. and the Minister of Community Great. Safety Great. and Correctional Services for their commitment to Northern Ontario and the kinds of assets we need to offer yeah. modern facilities to Ontario's finest. You know, Mr. Speaker, I had one of my finest moments in my political career when I stood shoulder to shoulder with Chief Superintendent David Lucas, Inspector Nathan Schmidt, and several members of the OPP in the beautiful town of Fort Francis to announce a new OPP facility. Mr. Speaker, this will offer improved amenities, address appropriate workplace health and safety issues. Uh, it will get rid of obsolete design and technologies uh, and a lack of overall space, and more importantly, Mr. Speaker, a place to engage our communities. Bonds. These guys do great work in vast regions of our province. We're proud of them. We're proud for this opportunity in Fort Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul's. Oh. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Children have been back to school for over a week. This government has left teachers with the dangerously outdated 1998 curriculum, which fails to teach kids how to keep themselves safe in today's society. These are the issues Ontarians expect their government to deal with. But instead, the Premier has called us here to force through this unprecedented anti-democratic legislation. Does the Minister of Education believe that violating the rights and freedoms of Toronto voters is more important than finally giving teachers the material they desperately need to keep our children safe? Minister of Education. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Our position is that we're well order, our opposition come to order. legislative rights as a, as a democracy, as a, as, a, as a government that received uh, 2.3 million for Essex, come to order. in the June 7th election to place a mandate before the table. And yesterday, after the Premier uh, recalled the legislature, we tabled a, a very order. urgent priority for this government. Uh, the efficient local government act, and we we believe that that's a, a bill that this legislature needs to deal with forthwith. There are many many priorities that this government has in our province, but you know because there is an October 22nd election, there's a bit of urgency. We we need to have this bill go through the legislative process as fast as possible. We need to have a council at City Hall that's not Response. arguing about the amount of politicians, but actually argue about the important issues that are facing Torontonians. That's exactly Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Education. I hope she can answer her own question this time. The 
1998 curriculum that this government has recklessly forced back into classrooms doesn't even include the word consent, let alone a lesson on it. Our children's safety is urgent. Our children's health and well-being is critical. Why does the Minister of Education think it is more urgent to trample on the fundamental rights and freedoms of my constituents than to provide our teachers with the curriculum that, again, will keep the students safe? Take your seat. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, well again, uh, again, Speaker, you know, the decision uh, Monday of the Justice Order. Member for St. Catharines, come to order. Member for St. Paul's, come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Member for Waterloo, come to order. The government side, come to order. The Premier, come to order. Minister. To, uh, thank you, Speaker. You know, this government has lots of priorities. However, the, the Justice's decision on Monday has precipitated a recall of the Legislature and the Efficient Local Government Act to be tabled yesterday. But, you know, Speaker, I think I understand where the NDP are coming from. They're a party, based on what I've heard in this Legislature and out in the community, I, I don't think they actually want new affordable housing built in Toronto. I don't think they, they want infrastructure to be worked on with our government and Toronto City Council. I don't think they want new transit. You know what, Speaker? I think they should rename themselves to the No Development Party. I think Next question. Order. 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 Member for Davenport, please come to order. I have to be able to hear the next question and the response. Next question, the member for Cambridge. It's an honour to be able to stand here and speak. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Today, the Ontario Securities Commission published proposed amendments to investment regulations that would ban embedded commissions and the sale of certain investment vehicles. Speaker, I am concerned that if these proposed amendments are implemented, the Ontario Securities Commission will discontinue a payment option for purchasing mutual funds that have enabled Ontario families and investors to save towards retirement and other financial goals. Can the minister please explain to this House why the Ontario Securities Commission is taking these steps and how our government will respond? Speaker, uh, the proposed amendments the member is referring to result from a process initiated under the previous Liberal government. And the member is indeed correct. The proposed changes would make it more difficult for Ontario families and investors to save towards their financial goals. We want to be clear. Our government does not agree with the proposal as it is currently drafted. Premier Ford's government is committed to making Ontario a competitive place to invest, grow, and create jobs. We made a promise to the people of Ontario, and that's a promise we intend to keep. We have said it many times, and we'll repeat it again today. We want the world to know that Ontario is open for, for business. business. Yes. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. Speaker, I am pleased to hear our government does not support the proposal by the Ontario Securities Commission as it is currently drafted. It is important to me and to all members of this House that we ensure Ontario is open for business. 
I'm sure the minister will agree that it is essential for Ontario to grow our capital markets while ensuring strong investor protections. Could the minister please explain how he plans to work towards making Ontario a competitive place to invest? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member from Cambridge for the question. Let me assure you that we are absolutely committed to making Ontario the attractive place to invest and do business. That is why we will continue to work with other provinces, territories and stakeholders to explore potential alternatives outside of the measures of the Ontario Security Commission's uh, proposal. We must do everything we can to ensure fair and efficient capital markets alongside strong investor protections. In doing so, we will continue to allow people across Ontario to save towards retirement and their other financial goals. Speaker, it is critical that we give the hardworking Bonds. people of Ontario every opportunity to have their money work for them. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Meshkegawak, James Bay, has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning unsafe school conditions. This matter will be debated Wednesday at 6 p.m. Member for Timmins on a point of order. Uh, just on a very quick point of order, earlier you ruled uh, one of our members out of order for imputing motive understanding Order 23, and I understand that, and we are uh, doing everything we can to uh, make sure we adhere. But I ask that you do the same to the Premier, because time and time again, he stands in this House and he impugns motive of the opposition, and I would ask you to hold him to account for his actions and those of his minister who does the same. I will acknowledge the member's point of order and reiterate once again that Minister of Transportation come to order. Once again, reiterate to all members of the House that it is inappropriate to impute motive in your questions, in your statements, in your preambles. I would ask all members to, to think about that and do it. There being no further or deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.